good afternoon. I'm uh, Nicola and this is the post lunch slot. So we're going to be very engaging and, and stimulating about <laughs> web archiving. Um, although there is a bit of uh, legal stuff in, in this presentation. So, so bear with us. Um, you, you have two for the price of one this afternoon. Um, uh, my, uh, myself, I'm going to, to talk um, about the UK web archive. I'm going to give an overview in order to provide some uh, insights into the collecting uh, processes that, that form the boundaries of our data set. Um, you'll then hear from Helena, who will talk about what researcher access looks like and how we've engaged with researchers so far. So, uh, a little bit of uh, history. The, the British Library, the National Libraries of, of Scotland uh, and Wales began archiving the UK web since 2004. Initially, on a small scale selective basis, so we had subject specialists who were selecting individual websites within their areas of, of interest on a, a permission cleared basis. But since 2013, the six UK legal deposit libraries under the banner of the UK Web Archive have been archiving the UK web at scale under the terms of the regulations, the non-print legal deposit regulations. So this was a, an extension in 2013 of, of print legal deposit regulations. So in 2013 we were able to archive um, UK websites, e-journals, e-books, everything considered published on the on the web. Um, additionally we hold a data set of .uk websites from the Internet Archive from 1996 to 2013 which Helena will will talk a little bit um, more about. Um, so on the on the, the slide, a, a history of our user interface over over time, from the the very sort of basic, quiet, shy interface in two thousand and four, a very busy, um, a cluttered interface in two thousand and eight, and a nice clean interface uh, in in twenty um, in twenty eighteen. Uh, Non-print legal deposit regulations. So if, as a researcher, you're approaching our data set, um, I'm, a, I'm afraid there's, there's quite a bit to, to engage with to, to understand the, the provenance of, of the data set. So this really is the, the most essential starting point. Uh, we carry out web archiving under the terms of, of, regulation, of the regulations. And the regulations enable the libraries to archive online works published in the UK. Uh, so uh, the, the legislation then puts a bit more definition of what we consider um, a published work uh, and what we mean by UK. So we have this kind of artificial construct of imposing this UK territoriality on, on the, the, the web. In, in practice, we, we automate this in that we can automatically scope in websites that sit on a UK top level domain name .uk .scot .cumru, or we can target a website that's hosted on a server physically located in the UK with a GeoIP lookup. There are some things that are specifically excluded from the, the legislation and these are those sites that, that constitute an audiovisual channel, for example, YouTube or BBC iPlayer. So we can't archive these, these channels, but we can archive a website where a YouTube video or um, an audio file is incidental to the website and there is a specific piece of text that describes what we mean by the incidental occurrence of a, of, of a, a video or an audio file on a, on a website. 
Uh, we don't archive private intranets, emails, um, this kind of uh, private material is, is out of scope. Content that is not considered published. Uh, now, you can already see here that this is a little bit subjective. As, as Richard was talking about earlier, what we consider published on the internet, particularly if we're thinking about social media, doesn't really have a nice legal definition that, that we can follow. Um, so we're sort of navigating this, this territory of, well, did, did this person publishing this onto their social media account consider that it was published? Did they, did they think that the UK legal deposit libraries were going to be so interested in it that they were going to be preserving it for, for perpetuity? And then researchers were going to be looking at it. All of these sorts of issues are, are slightly um, uncharted. Um, but because we, the libraries, um, have um, this protection in the form of the legislation, so protection from, from copyright, protection from, from defina defamation, we, we have some um, exclusions under GD GDPR because of the regulations, um, we must ensure that we're working within them. And, uh, and one of the, the main stipulations is that we can't provide open access to this data set. So it's um, reading room <coughs> access only, which means that as a, a researcher, you're going to have to travel to one of the six reading rooms to access the, the full collection although we do make as much available as we possibly can online, but this is with <coughs> the permission of the, of the rights holders. So, um, our collection policy, our collection policy pretty much hangs off uh, the, the regulations, and our key collecting principles are that we collect without filtering. Uh, so the, the, uh, as much as we can do, we don't pre-select or, or filter. We try to be comprehensive, inclusive, as representative as we, as we possibly can. Um, as far as we're technically and practically able to be within the, the legislation and within the limits of the, the crawling technology, but uh, you'll be understanding that, that these limitations um, mean that when we are doing our large scale crawls, it's a challenge for us to archive the UK, UK web comprehensively or even truly representatively. Um, for example, we automatically <coughs> scope in top level UK domain names, but most of what we're interested might sit on a dot com top level domain name, particularly um, social media. A lot of this content is on servers in, in the US, in, in San Francisco, in, in Ireland, in, uh, in Germany. Um, uh, so it means, it means that um, there, there are big gaps in our collection unless we manually identify the content that we're interested in. And in terms of the, the technical factors, the, the web crawler that we use is geared up for bulk automated crawls and it performs very well in this respect, um, but it's not optimised for high fidelity crawling of, of very dynamic and, and complex websites such as social media. There's a significant cost in archiving websites and so for this reason we cap our domains at 500 megabytes. So the majority of websites are scoped in, in their entirety, but there are a lot of large websites um, that, that, we, that we miss. Um, uh, the, uh, Robots Text Protocol, we ignore this at the level of the homepage, but we respect robots exclusions further into uh, a website. So all of this is to say that our large data set, um, it's, it's potentially missing important uh, resources and there's significant gaps in the collection. So I'm just making the, the, the case that this, this is kind of the information that the, the researcher needs to be armed with uh, when coming to, to our data set. 
Uh, so to augment these broad uh, annual domain crawls, we undertake additional selection strategies to try to at least in, in some way address these, these gaps. And we have an online curation tool which we open up to as many users as, as we can across the legal deposit libraries and ex externally so that we increase inclusivity, we inc increase representation, we, we try to um, onboard um, curators and, and I mean curators in, in, in the, the sense of the, the role that they're playing in our archive. We tend to in include um, as, as widely as we, as we possibly can do. So this online tool allows the, the users to scope in content that we're not necessarily picking up as part of our automated crawls. It allows the user to select content that they might want to visit more frequently in, in more in depth. We can add uh, metadata so we can build uh, collections and add, um, add titles, perform quality assurance and also apply for open access to selected websites. And the, 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 the future value I think of this um, data set, so the, the administrative side of the, the tool, is that it hopefully in, informs our selection policy, so what were we considering important at the time. So our curators represent different business areas across the legal deposit libraries, different collection areas. Um, other uh, partners that we work with, different libraries and archives and, and museums that don't necessarily have the infrastructure to perform web archiving themselves, but have the subject expertise in areas that, uh, that we uh, don't have. Most recently, we've been talking to the Wimbledon Lawn Tennis uh, uh, Association. So we had a very um, interesting uh, visit there. Um, um, so, uh, uh, also um, online news, for example, is a massively important um, collection. And so for this reason, we target online news sites. We have several thousand titles that we revisit on a, a daily, weekly or monthly basis. So uh, we undertake various types of, of what we call special collection or curated collection and these are undertaken for example in response to political uh, events um, so for example we've been doing quite a bit of, of work on on brexit we started collecting around the the uh, uk um, uh, uh, referendum um, on departure from the, the european U union we then were uh, collecting around brexit and sort of in the next few 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 weeks couple of, of months we'll be um engaging with brexit 2 whatever happens brexit 2 the the revenge um, um uh, uh, so we have researcher led collections so we uh we work with academics who have their own um, areas of, of expertise for example we worked with muslims trust and cultural dialogue uh, projects um, and we also um, operate so-called rapid response collections in response to unfolding uh, events. Uh, I'm going to quickly uh, now, because I, I think I'm actually a little bit over time, but I'm going to quickly talk about our tools and, and technologies. So we operate with the Heritrix crawler framework so this was written by the the internet archive and continues to be developed by a community of web archiving technology uh, technologists this is a, the state-of-the-art bulk web crawler um, as i say it performs very well at scale um, but but not particularly well with with complex websites when we're approaching our domain scale crawl we take a list of starting seeds, and this is provided by um, Nominet, the, the UK domain name registry. The seeds are provided by 
our curators um, via the annotation software uh, and it's also informed by those seeds that in the past we've identified. So a web, a web crawler follows links, identifies everything that's in scope, so we've set the parameters to only collect UK uh, content and it continues to fo uh, follow these links until it's exhausted. This takes about uh, three months and it will return uh, 10 million hosts, it will return 2 billion items, so that's HTML pages, images, documents, scripts, audio, visual files. And this is 70 or 100 terabytes of compressed data. Um, it is uh, over half a petabyte of compressed data that we hold at the moment. There's then several processes that are, are run on, on the data. We take work files um, and we move them onto our Hadoop clusters, our large storage system. On here, lots of different processes are run. There are two main indexing processes that make the data available. That's the CDX index, which compiles a list of all of the URLs. Um, the URLs then point to the, the work file, the container um, file, so that we can play back archived websites. We use software called Wayback Software. So for a close reading of websites, you can visit an instance of a, a website and experience that as it was on the, on the live internet. A separate process happens once a month and this is the solar indexing. So the solar product allows us to build indexes for a faceted search. So we'll, we will input the, 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 the facets that we want to, to get out. So a domain name search suffix, um, suffix search document um, type. And we also push data from our curation software into to solar so that we can present the title inf information. Um, and on the, on the screen on the um, right is from the Solar API. Um, now, this is something that we don't currently provide for, for researchers. There are two main barriers. The first is that directly through the API, one could actually delete the, the, the data. Uh, and the second is the legislative framework, which you, you haven't heard the last of today because Stuart will be explaining a little bit more about the, the barriers. But the legislation is quite um, strict about researcher access and we're unable to provide access to the text of archived websites. Um, so in conclusion, I just wanted to, to leave on, on a note that the, the the, the Solo API, the CDX API, are something that we're uh, working to provide researcher access to um, in the future. So that concludes my whistle-stop talk, uh, and I'll hand you over to Helena, who will uh, talk in a little bit more detail about what access looks like. So we have uh, four access points to the UK Web Archive, but three of them are browsable, and then the fourth one is just some uh, data sets that have been taken from metadata and, um, and that's fully open access and you can download it and um, work away with your own tools on that data. Um, so we have mixed access. So just in November last year, you saw the screenshot Nicola had up first of the different websites we have had over the years. So we just launched a new interface in November last year and that gives us mixed access. So it kind of um, highlights all the stuff that uh, you can only view in the reading room, but through the website you can actually see what's reading room only and what's open access and uh, filter your search that way. And then we've got the legal deposit content because you can also access the legal deposit content through the uh, catalogues in the legal deposit library reading rooms. And then we've got the Shine interface as Nicola mentioned. It's uh, all the .uk websites archived by the Internet Archive from 1996 to April 2013 when the regulations came into effect. So I'm just going to quickly go through each one of these points. So we've got the website, and um, so I did this on a screenshot from my personal device, so it automatically defaulted to viewable online. So viewable online means that we've got open access permission and you can access on any device. But if you want to see what's reading room only, you need to then manually change to at libraries, which is any of the six UK legal deposit libraries. And then, so I've done a search of big data. 
you need to use the double quotation marks. Boolean logic is the best way to search, but we're still kind of working on some kinks in our search uh, results. So, um, but you can see quite a lot of results, and this is just open access content, and you get a list, and then you can facet, uh, refine your search more by looking at even just what type of domain the suffix was, or particular websites we're looking at and talking about that subject. And if you want to even access more data, the beta.webarchive.org.uk uh, has got a lot more of the domain full, but we're still kind of ironing out the kinks on um, that. So uh, this is a screenshot from a Trinity College uh, Dublin access guide to uh, legal deposit. So um, this is the same for any reading room you go into, and it's for any digital content that's come through non-print legal deposit regulations. So academic journals, e-books, websites, you all have to access through this. Lots of limitations. You cannot download anything. You cannot save anything. You cannot take a photo of the screen. Uh, you can print, but it's through the library printing system, and uh, it's hard to do double-sided, and it's expensive. So <laughs> there's only so much you can do with that. Um, then you have the Shine interface, which is all open access, and it's got a much better search uh, functions as well, and it's got some search tips to help you refine your search, and it's got faceted searching as well, similar to um, the main website. And then, but you also have trends analysis, and uh, so you can see trends of how popular certain phrases were over time. But in the early um, .uk web space of the late 90s, it was dominated by academic publishing, so some terms uh, seem more popular than they really are. And then the later part of this uh, data set is just more general publishing, of lots of different content. And you can do a random sample of 100 sites, and then they link out to the Internet Archive's Wayback Capture of it. So then we've got the data sets. So um, this is all open access, and you can run your own tools over these data sets. And there's four different ones available. So the host level links is quite a popular one, and Peter Webster has done a lot of work on this. And he's on his blog, he's got a lot of methodology uh, outlined as well, so it's a good one to follow on what websites are linking to other websites. And then these are some of the projects that we've collaborated on. So this came out of the <coughs> Domain Data for the Arts and Humanities project, and the, the requirements of the researchers uh, were fed into developing this tool. Um, so then we've got, uh, I mentioned this project, and a lot of the case studies used in this research were then fed into the publication of the Webus History, which is an open access publication and it gives uh, the methodology and the problems and challenges that they had, but also the opportunities for working with archived websites. And then we've also worked collaboratively with the Alan Turing Institute. And this is one of the semantic projects of looking at how um, uh, language has changed over time. So we can see Twitter there in 2006, when Twitter was first launched, then it just exponentially went up the, word, the meaning of the word tweet. <laughs> and uh, there's a video presentation there as well you can follow. And uh, it's very quick with the software that you can work with. <laughs>